Welcome to Heart Mindify. Before we start the show, just a reminder to share, rate, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening to it. And please give us a five star rating. It helps us beat the big tech algorithms. I'm John Izzy. Change can be difficult for a lot of us, but when we understand what makes us tick, we develop a better understanding of who we are and begin a journey of discovering our best self. Join me for a free session at johnizzy.com. And I'm Kim Cordy, creator of the Emotion Chef Framework, an emotion management tool. Thoughts drive emotions and emotions drive thoughts, but it's our emotions that drive our decisions and behaviors. Find out more at kimcordy.com. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Knowing each other personally and socially for the past 10 years, Kim and John have joined forces, bringing years of experience and training providing a platform for growth and personal development, along with a little humor. John is the heart, Kim is the mind, and together they are Heart Mindified. This is John as the co-host of Heart Mindify. Kim and I want to wish all of our listeners a happy new year. As we embark on season two of our show, We want to acknowledge all the people who have died during the storming of the nation's capital on January 6th, 2021. May all of them rest in peace. The recording of this show took place on January 7th, the day after the tragedy at the Capitol. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Well, Kim, Happy New Year, I think. Started off with a bang now, hasn't it? Oh my gosh, what a crazy turn of events yesterday. Everybody was so excited for 2020 to end. And wow, I thought we couldn't get any lower. And yet we did. Ah, uh, we've become, you're going to have to pull us out of the dirt at this point. We're all six feet under. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's nuts. Yeah. It is crazy. And how do you explain this? How do you, how do you explain it? I don't know. Listening to the news coverage and going over in my head of all the different possibilities of what could have happened or what could have sparked it or, and I just kind of sit there and go, wow, everything that we have been talking about for the past year is our words matter. What we yeah. say matters. How we treat people matter. What we say to ourselves matters. Yeah, and our thoughts and emotions. Yeah. All those things matter in our ability to find happiness, in our ability to find happiness and see happiness in others. It's just mind-boggling that we don't, as a society, recognize that. Yeah. Well, you know my saying... Thoughts drive emotions and emotions drive thoughts, but emotions drive decisions and behaviors. And if that wasn't crystal clear and fully evident, these, the thoughts that were propagated and, and, and just fed to these people and they just ate it up, you know, every last morsel took it down to the Capitol and acted. Yeah. Enacted and enacted in a way where it takes our vernacular and puts it in motion physically, right? It's, Mm -hmm. you know, we always talk about this class bully, you know, and to stop a class bully, you, a lot of people will say, just knock him out and he'll never be a bully again. And that's what happens. That's what happened yesterday. It's the class bully finally turned violent in a way where the threshold of the capital was exposed. And that's the result of years of violent rhetoric that's turned into physical confrontation. It's, it's pretty horrific. Um, 
I yesterday, I don't know about you. We we spoke on and off throughout the day. Yes. I, I was emotionally drained at the end of the day. I couldn't stop until I don't know, watching TV till one. It, my husband was saying that he started at 10 in the morning and here it was almost 10 o'clock at night. He goes, I've been watching this straight through. It's, it's, uh, it was, it was a, a lot because you've never seen anything like it. I know. And you know, I was so excited for yesterday, not because Biden was going to be president or not because, you know, Trump lost. I was excited to see our constitution act itself out you know it was like the living will of the people is going to be confirmed tomorrow and it just turned into complete chaos and it was out of control and then once i was glued into the tv i i was in for the duration i mean i on eastern time i didn't go to bed till I don't think I walked upstairs to my bedroom to about 1230. And then what did I do? I turned the TV on when I was in the bed. So I don't know what time I actually fell asleep, but it was during the Pennsylvania debates. And I think at that point, my mind was just turning off and I just woke up this morning absolutely exhausted. You know, and yeah. it was crazy. It got me to thinking, you know, I, I talk about personal culture and corporate culture, but you know, this, the culture of our country and it's hard to have a single culture, right? Yep. And it really is because there's always these subcultures and we are so enormous in size that our, our ability to have a single culture, it just doesn't make sense. Right. But right. there is a leadership culture that actually does trickle down and well, like it or not, the, the culture of Trump, you've seen how it's changed the politics in Washington. Oh yeah. And even the people who, um, people turned in how they treated each other even more. So it, it, it created a higher fracture and we see this, this kind of fracture within organizations. And someone asked me yesterday, his name is Ajit Dadani. He's a, um, an empathy strategist and he goes into companies and he tries to develop empathy at the top levels because it, it filters down. It doesn't right. do any good to do it just at the bottom or just at the top. It's a full organization, but if you don't have it from the top, it's never going to filter down because it, it you're, you're leading that culture. And he said to me, what he didn't say, he asked me, what would you say to an organization if it had that same type of fracturing within it that we see in the country and communication, taking a lead in how you communicate and how you listen and how you accept other people's opinions and embrace them and truly respect them. It makes all the difference in the flipping world. There's no respect yeah. anymore. No. None. No, and 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 I and I think what we're finding is that there's a cry from the American people that want change. There's a cry from the American people that recognize the division that is so deep in politics. And they're crying and no one's listening to them that should be listening, right? It's like we're just going to continue to divide and continue to divide. And it culminated in yesterday's attack on the Capitol. I mean, that was the that was the culmination of four years and prior years too. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. I'm not yeah. I'm I was not blaming say. the re yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going down that road. But it it it, it became in the last four years, it became okay. Yes. Right? It became mm -hmm. okay to verbally assault people. It became okay. And that caused a huge division and culminated in yesterday's attack. 
that alone is something that we as a culture, we as a society need to look at within ourselves. Is that the type of human being I want to be? I can't shake the fact that the lady that was murdered, right, shot at at the Capitol yesterday, decided that her choice to listen to Donald Trump was more important than her daughter and her husband. That that act that she was going to do was more important than the people that she loves. And I'm not saying that she's a bad person by any means. I'm just saying that the choice that she made went beyond what she probably thought was going to happen when she got there. And then you get caught up in all the fanfare of the events that are taking place. And you forget, you know, the people that care about you. You forget the people that depend on you and your, your whatever is, is more important becomes more important than anything else in that moment. And that's what happened yesterday with her. And that's, that's horrible. That's just horrible, right? I don't know. Well, to me, this highlights the importance of the work that I'm doing, that you do. And that is to help people stop and think to be present before they make those decisions. So it's really easy for us to say, oh, I'm not in a a situation where I'm emotionally charged and my emotions are driving my decisions as when you're in the situation. And you have to have that training, honestly, that the ability to regulate your emotions, to stop and question what you're doing Does this make sense? Is this the right thing to do? To not let your heart, we've talked how many times about what does my gut say? What does my brain say? What does my heart say? And this is a complete moment of passion. And it's without emotion regulation, without emotional intelligence, these situations happen. It's because there's no thought. And there's no training to say, hey, I I need to be present here for a second. This is not smart. This is not right. The comment has come up like they were they beat up a police officer. They they attacked police officers. There was all kinds of things thrown at them. These are the same people who say blue lives matter. Yeah. So it's so this is what happens when passions get too out of control when you let your emotions rule, because then even your values, because I am sure that each one of those individuals, well, I'm not going to say I'm sure, but I, I'm not going to say that they don't value blue lives, but they didn't at that point in time. So where were their values at that point? They were lost. That's exactly right. They were lost in their emotion of the event mm-hmm. and, and and everything that was going on around that. I'm going to take a different look at it because Somebody asked me on that wonderful site of Facebook about this whole situation. And I was reading through the comments of what people were saying in reaction to what took place yesterday at the Capitol. And my response was, you know, words matter. And, and what we just talked about, you know, that, that now the, the words have turned violent. And he responded back with, you're just a sheep. You're just someone who doesn't want to admit that your feelings get hurt from what people say. And I responded back with, you've completely missed the point. The point is, it's not just the words that you say, it's the motivation behind the words you choose to use. What is the motivation behind those words? That motivation is out of anger. That motivation is out of a violent understanding of 
what you can do and get away with. It's the motivation behind the words that we need to look at. You're right. The words themselves don't carry weight. What carries weight is the, um, is the motivation behind the words. That's what carries the weight. You know what I mean? Yeah. So my whole, my whole point, it's the motivation behind the words. That's why last night when after they regained control of the Capitol and, you know, and a lot of the senators and a lot of the House um, of Representatives stood up and condemned, you know, what had just happened. And, you know, everybody was making a big deal about, Lynn, you know, Lindsey Graham. And I thought, you know, I don't know what your motivation is behind what you just said. Because four hours ago, you were thinking totally differently. Your motivation was not out of love of country. Your motivation was self-serving and self-serving the president. And now all of a sudden, you're coming out with condemning everything that's going on and going against what you've been saying since the election. So the question is not, it's not just the words. It's the motivation behind those words. That needs to be looked at. I, I, I can't, I I agree, obviously, (laughs) you know, I mean, I agree. And when you talk about motivation, uh, I've been starting to promote more the idea of life intelligence because emotional intelligence takes you so far, but life intelligence really pushes the envelope and really expands you because you can be good at labeling your emotions, right? But Mm -hmm. If you're not tackling the fears, the things that you feel are encroaching on your ego, because really what drives a lot of the hatred, trying to protect your ego or trying the fear of losing something or if of looking bad, of trying to protect this, this image that you think in your head needs to exist that ne- isn't necessarily true. Until we start to examine and conquer these dumb ideas that we have about race, about being right politically, about um, not sharing or or truly compromising for the good of others and always worrying about ourselves, because that's what this is all about. This is all about looking all about me. How is this impacting me? How is this impacting my ambitions? You know, how many times do we hear on the, the, the politician who's retiring and they have nothing to lose, so they do the right thing on a position and they go against their party? And I'm talking any party. Yep. Or, or the employee who's retiring. So they, they take a stand that they wouldn't take out of fear of losing something. They don't know for sure, because remember, and unless the bear is in the campground, you don't right. really know how it's going to turn out. And that's that's a major driver. And being able to get outside of ourselves and really examine the fears, uh, it's, it's, it, it, that's what helps develop life intelligence. Yeah. You know, and it's, and, and it's taking, and it's taking a stance, right? A lot of people say, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. I can't control what goes on in the house. You can control what goes on, right? Because if your attitude, if your motivation for inclusiveness, if you are motivated for equality and true equality, right? I'm not talking about just the equality on paper. I'm talking about True equality, meaning do you call people out in your circle when they aren't professing equality, right? If you hear a racial slur, do you stand up for yourself because you don't agree with that racial slur or do you hide, right? So yeah, you can do something because if you change the way that you respond to certain things and if you change the way or or the people around you, right? And choose not to associate with them anymore. And then they ask you why. And you say, because I'm tired of listening to the hate that's coming out of your mouth on a continual basis. You're making change. You're standing up for what you believe. And that's motivated from goodness. 
that's not motivated from hate. That's the point. So yeah, you can make a difference. You might not have the ear of the senator, but by the people that you come in contact with, by the words that come out of your mouth that are motivated from a tamed ego, that are motivated from compassion, that are motivated from empathy, you do make a difference. You absolutely do make a difference. I Yes, you do. And what you get for that is respect and trust. Yeah. Who, who respects or trusts a lot of the leaders? And I don't mean just political leaders. I mean leaders of organizations that you that you feel that your leader has your back, even within families. Like, how can you respect or trust a parent, a sibling, uh, someone in in your your inner circle that you don't trust or respect? It's huge. In, yeah. in, in back in the day when I was more religious, we were we were reading the Bible, like I think we went through as an organization the Bible once a year. And I was always struck by that scripture that talked about a man will love, will I think lo- deeply love his wife or deeply love his wife, something like that. And then she will respect him. Because, mm-hmm. because yes, women have to have respect for love, but I think all people do. And that emotion of respect is akin to love. It's not exactly the same, but it's that high regard that you have for somebody that might not even be an intimacy, but it's right up there with, with admiration and all of those great qualities that you want to have someone feel for you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love that. And, and, and I think that's so, I think that's so important. And that doesn't come with saying the right thing. That doesn't come with encouraging the right person that comes from a place of internal peace that is motivated out of love and respect for yourself. And then in return, that love and respect is extended to others. Yeah. And, you know, you can say it on the surface. Oh, I love everybody. Do you? Yeah. Well, you know how I feel about the word love. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But do you, because you're acting really ugly right now. Well, we used, when we were girls, you know, young teen girls, we had this term for guys and we called it Atna. Oh, he's got a case of Atna. All talk, no. Yeah. All talk, no action. (laughs) So, so there's a lot of people with Atna. That's funny. I yeah. like it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's not somebody, um, somebody posted something and I can't, can't remember who it was. And I don't want to say that I created the quote because I didn't create the quote, but the quote was dehumanizing rhetoric that paves the way for taking violent action. I think we just spoke to that in so many ways, right? It's the, it's the continual rhetoric of people that dehumanizes their fellow man and woman that eventually will result in violent action, physical violent action. And that's what we've been saying. And it's, it's, um, we need to, you know, it's not just as easy to say we need to do better. We have to do better. We have to do better as a society and the only way to do that is to do better on an individual level, I think, anyway. I just looked up the definition of rhetoric. It's the art of effective or persuasive speaking or writing, especially the use of figures of speech or other compositional techniques. I call it being a bullshit artist. <laughs> yes, that is yeah, right. Yeah. And and so... And that's what rhetoric usually is, bullshit. So why not call it what it is? And it's all designed to use words to persuade people to a way of thinking that isn't necessarily true. 
if people could just think more and not just listen to what they want to hear, it would just be such an amazing world. Yeah. And one of the things that I find myself doing lately is taking the group concept out of the communication. In other words, not talking about a group of people, but pointing out the person that's actually being a bullshit artist, right? So instead of saying, you know, these damn Republicans or these damn Democrats, I'm now saying Derek Evans of West Virginia, you know, it's putting a name to the behavior that you find disgusting as opposed to categorizing the disgusting behavior as an entire group. If we begin to approach it that way, what we're doing is we're we're going to the crux of the problem and we're not collectively pulling in people that might not respond that way or might not act in the behavior that you're suggesting they are just because they're the same group within the same group, right? Because there are good people that are Republicans. My gosh, I have a ton of friends that are Republicans and they're good hearted people that will call out Trump and behavior within their own party as wrong. Those are the type of people that I respect. Those are the type of people that get my attention because they're not saying all Democrats or all Republicans or all blacks or all whites. It's you are doing this. You are doing this, right? It's you're doing this. It's, it's not everybody. It's you. That, that's very smart because your brain doesn't, know any differently other than what you tell it. Right. So if you say, oh, all these Republicans or all these Democrats or all these Jews or Muslims or whatever it is, your brain goes, oh, it's all of them. So yeah. no matter who you meet, who's a Jew or a Muslim or a Republican or a Democrat, it just goes, oh, you're whatever that label you assigned it. That's just how the brain works. It doesn't see it doesn't hear, it doesn't smell, it doesn't taste, it can't touch anything. It is receiving data. That's why we have to be so careful about the data we feed our brain. Yeah. I yeah. never I never understood why people said, "Oh, playing these video games of, you know, violence that doesn't impact kids or or listening to this music that that denigrates women and glorifies violence. Oh, that's that doesn't hurt anything. I, I, I call that rhetorical bullshit. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's what we've deemed as a society as being okay. I can't stress the importance enough on the problem is individual behavior. It's not a collective body of people. So, you know, if you want to make a change in a group, make a change within yourself. So let me pose this to you then, John. You know? I, I, I just want to pose this to you. So let's just say, um, because it's so in the news, we're just going to go with, with this right now. Okay. The Republican Party is being, there is a lot of talk about how they're going to have a hard time bouncing back from this. And there's a fracture there like all the problems that have developed and the perception of republicans the party the gop how would you suggest that you if you've been a lifelong republican how do you suggest that they kind of differentiate between what the party is doing versus what the individuals that they vote for or they appreciate within the party. You know, see, this is where it starts to get tricky, right? Right. So what I suggest is, is, you know, I want, let me put it this way. I want elective, I want elected officials who are going to stand up for what they believe, right? Whether I agree with it or not, that's what I want. I don't want political officials to be elected to positions where their personal beliefs and what got them there in the first place doesn't matter anymore because now they're part of a bigger organization. Listen, look at what's happened 
recently with with McConnell. You know, we are not going to do this. Well, by doing that, you are taking away an individual's right to tell you what he or she believes. And you're preventing her or him from telling you their truth. And so what I think in order for the Republican Party to, and for the Democratic Party too, to regain respect, they're going to need to be committed to themselves and say, yes, I agree with with Republican politics, but this behavior is wrong and this needs to stop. Instead of not being allowed to say the second part of that sentence. Yeah, you have to right? act as a collective. Exactly. And I think that's the only way you're going to gain respect again. You know, I was talking to my neighbor this morning and I said to her, I said, I truly believe, and I know a lot of people can disagree with me and that's fine. But I said, I truly believe that Biden was elected for president because we need somebody in the White House now that focuses on unification. Whether you agree with the Democratic policies or not, he's a man that wants to bring unity and respect back to the government. He knows he's only going to have one term. He knows he's not going to have two terms. And we need somebody right now with a, you know, with a head on their shoulders that respects themselves and in return respects other people. And I think he's the right person at the right time to lead this country moving forward. Now, that's my personal belief. How does he do that? By showing the American people and fellow Democrats and fellow Republicans that he respects himself enough so that his actions show respect among other people. It's the only way he's going to be able to do it. Whether you agree with his policies tomorrow, we could wake up on the 21st of January and gas prices go to $6, $6 a gallon in our area. Right now they're two fifty. dollars um, oh, Please. But, I, I know, but you get my point I haven't you get my point, though, right? in 20,000 years in I know. California. I know, but you get my point, right? It's like, you know, Democrats are coming in, gas prices are going to go up. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that that's probably going to happen, right? And we're going to see a lot of that. But I think if you if you have a person in the White House, and we need it right now, a person in the White House that respects himself, respects the people around him, that in turn is going to have a major effect on, um, on the government and a major effect on the American people. And enough so where I think that's the only thing that's going to settle the division right now. I hope it doesn't shut the division up because the one thing I've liked about these past four years is the fact that I'm starting to see people's true colors where before it was hidden. Now we're starting to see it. So I kind of like that in a way because now I know where you're coming from. Um, So I hope it's not hidden under the, you know, under the pillow, but um, I hope it does soften things up a little bit so that we can get back to, you know, decency. And I think this is also a good time to look inward at ourselves. It's so easy to look outward at everyone around and say, you need to make this change. You need to, you know, blah, 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 and all this stuff outwardly. But it's a, it, it's been a good time for me to take a look at what I think, how I feel, how, how well do I communicate we can always, always, always be better. And the, the, be honest with you, I am kind of one of those concepts of looking at the group and it's hard to, to make it individual. Um, it's just natural. That's just how, how our brains work. So we can't, we can't fall into a trap where, oh, that's how we're made. Oh, that's my nature. I was born stubborn. 
which I was. So I, (laughs) (laughs) so I can't change. I can't be any different. Once again, bullshit. We can all change. And that's part of the glorious treasure of being a human. We can look at ourselves and we can make changes. I think that's part of why we're here is to explore who we are and to become, as you like to say, the best version of ourselves. And yeah. it's it's that journey that I have really discovered joy in. And it's not always easy, but man, I, I can't tell you how uh, this whole emotion chef and the, the process from where I was back in the early 2000s when my life seemed to have fallen apart and where I am today, the strength I have, the knowledge of who I am. And that is where your pillars lie. And when I say your pillars, I mean the strength and the foundation beneath you. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's awesome the way you just said that. And the one thing I would add to that would be, you know, I was working with a client once that was talking about, we were talking about that. We were talking about being stubborn. We were talking about different behaviors that he has. And I said to him, I said, just because you're a stubborn personality, use that for good. You know, be stubborn on the things that you need to be stubborn on yep. because they defame yourself or they defame another person. Be stubborn there. Look at the behavior that you as you say, we're born with, and how can you use it to benefit yourself and to benefit others? It's because true. there is a way to be stubborn and be positive. You know, it goes back to what's motivating you to do and say the things that you do and say. Look at that. Look at the motivation. I I think I told you I created that personal value statement. Yeah. And... In that personal value statement, let me pull it up. People are going to be able to take that, right? They're going to have, they're going to be able to soon to yeah. find out what they're, yeah, good. Yeah, time. it, it, um, we'll get into that. Maybe we'll have a, a whole show, a just, show about, uh, just about values and, and the importance of understand what your values are. Oh, yeah, yeah, that will be great. At the end of this personal value statement, when you, when you see what you value and also under, uncover the things that need to happen for you to feel it, right? Because we we all have values, but sometimes we mess ourselves up with the actions required for feelings. Because remember, um, emotions are driven by and, and drive thoughts and behaviors. So certain thoughts or behaviors will produce emotions, so right. it's it's under uncovering what's behind that. And so when I summarize this, I ask, is there a pattern in your responses that's linked to loss, regret, insecurity, or fear? That is a good idea to look at when you think about your actions or your responses to things. Are they coming in just in life? Like when you're so upset about something, is is this related to a loss, a regret? an insecurity or fear. And you might be surprised how much that drives a lot of what you do say and think and feel. Yeah, you're right. And if you listen to the way that people around you talk to each other, that their speech is coming from a place of goodness, a place of love, a place of respect. But you can also tell by the way a person talks where the where their speech is coming from a place of fear is coming from a place of of anger or of something that has happened to them. You can tell that as well. So, you know, like you're right. I mean, you know, we need to to we need to do better, but we do better by understanding what motivates us in the first place. And without understanding that motivation, then we're just giving in to our current day's emotion. We're just giving in to our current day's thought and that will spiral out of control. And we saw that happen yesterday. And my final thought about that is our, our current day thought and our current day emotions 
are produced from past events. Amen to that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, Kim, do better. I'm going to try. <laughs> and I will, too. It's every day I do try. I know. Me, too. Sometimes I get caught in my own selfishness, but um, I'm trying. That's all we can do, right? Well, John, if we didn't mess up, we wouldn't have anything to improve on. How boring would that be? I don't know that I ever really want to be perfect. No. God, no. Yeah. No. No, because the devil inside of me won't allow it. (laughs) (laughs) And there's my mother. My mother used to say, and my cousin always says, you were the orneriest person I ever met when you were younger. (laughs) I'm still pretty ornery. (laughs) Well, maybe some of us have a little bit more of the devil than others. Yeah, maybe so. (laughs) All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to us. And Kim, have a great week. All right. Have a great week. And thanks, everyone. Bye, John. All right. Bye bye. shows are available every Saturday right here on heartmindify.podbean.com or wherever you listen. Kim and I would like to thank each and every one of you for allowing us to be a small part of your life. Be kind to yourself and remember, our hearts tell the story, but our mind is the conductor.